Okay. So, hi and welcome to the Multi-Include webinar. Hopefully we have a few more people joining us, so we will very shortly start a conversation today. Uh, we would like you all to mute your, your laptops, Oops, and maybe I should mute mine as well. <laughs> <laughs> and then we would like you to um, follow us through the chat. If you want to have a comment or ask a question, please use the chat room. So with me today, I have two colleagues from the city of Malmö. We are at Malmö University, but I invited my colleagues from the city. So my name is Patricia Staub. I'm the director for the Center for Teaching and Learning. And I collaborate with both Anna and Marika. So please introduce yourself, Anna. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Anna Singate, and I work as a project manager for uh, a department called, in Swedish, Pedagogisk Inspiration, which is pedagogical inspiration and we're um, a department for school development and we work with all three school uh, departments in, in uh, Malmö which is from age one so preschool up till adult education. Hmm. Okay and Marika? Yes Marika Johansson I also work at the Center for Pedagogical Inspiration in Malmö City I work in a group called uh, Norms and Values, where we support the schools working with uh, equality, equity issues. Um, yeah. Okay. And I have one of the projects that is going to be presented today. Yes, and I just unfortunately closed down the computer. Oh no. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> but we will, anyway, we will tell you a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. We're going to have the city perspective because we have within the, the multi-include project focused a lot about uh, activities and projects done by teachers or um, NGOs or parents but this time we would like to move up a little and have a discussion about the more structural uh, prerequisites what is what a city can do to to support uh, inclusion in in schools from the very beginning and up to to higher education so we will share with you a few best practice from the city and we will also discuss together whether this, this is possible to uh, transform to any other context. So just give me a few moments and I will try to get us back, back on track, hopefully. I'd also like to add some apologies. I'm battling a cold and you can probably tell from my voice. Uh, I'm going to try to enunciate and, and um, be clear. But uh, yeah, we'll see how I handle the next hour. Let's see. Can they not see the screen anymore? No, that's what happened. Okay. But maybe I can still talk can a little still, bit about it. To give you um, the, the context, um, I don't know how much all of you know about Malmö, but to give you kind of a background. So Malmö is uh, the third largest city in Sweden. We have about 330,000 people and it's, uh, our population is growing quite rapidly. Uh, we are. We have moved from being a quite traditional industrial city to a more um, city with a focus on uh, education, knowledge, and entrepreneurship. Uh, we are also linked with Copenhagen through a bridge, so there's a lot of people commuting to C Copenhagen uh, to work. <laughs> so the overall population in in the region uh, is about four million people. And we're a very, very culturally diverse city with about 170 different nationalities, which we're very proud of. Uh, and there's more than 150 languages spoken in Malmö. And this, of course, uh, have impact on our schools and the kids that go to our schools. 32% uh, of the population in Malmö have at least three years of higher education. So we're, we have a high level of educated people living in our city and we're also a very young city so half of the population are under the age of 35 which is uh, both a, a, a bit of a challenge but mostly uh, an asset i'll just continue yeah please yes. continue and i um, very shortly hopefully the compulsory education, which is uh, what we're mostly going to be focusing on today, 
is, is our primary education from the age of six up to 15 in schools. Uh, we have in Malmö about 80 public schools. The vast majority of children in that age attends a public school. About only 7%, I think, is uh, attending uh, private schools. So there are about almost 33,000 students in our schools and approximately 6,000 employees. And the number of students is growing every week. The biggest challenges for our schools and our school department is goal attainment to, to make sure that all our students reach the goals of the curriculum, equal conditions for learning, so all, all children, regardless of their background, should reach the goals. School segregation is a challenge. Um, the increase in number of students is also a challenge because it leads to higher costs for production of new schools. The shortage of trained teacher is a huge challenge for us and that's not only for Malmö, it's for the whole Sweden. So we have a, a huge shortage of trained teachers, which all I think all school departments in, in, the, in the country tries to find a solution to. So it's not only a political issue, it's also um, a very uh, big challenge for our departments of schools to, to, to find trained teachers to teach in the classrooms. And also for universities then to educate teachers, of course. Uh, and this leads to uh, somewhat sometimes a stressful work environment for the, the school staff, mm -hmm. which is also a, a challenge for us. Uh, a way uh, to compensate for the, the schools in Malmö's challenges is um, to use a financial model to kind of compensate for the children's uh, various socio-economic backgrounds. So, uh, schools in Malmö are being funded based on uh, two ways. So, it's we have first a kind of a base funding that that all schools, depending on the area where they live and the population of students, is the same. So, uh, all grade oneers receives the same uh, same money in Malmö. So, that's the the kind of the baseline funding. And then we also have what we call a structural funding, and that's based on socioeconomic variables. Uh, so, for example, a school in a disadvantaged area receives more funding than a school in a more privileged area. And the variables that uh, is kind of behind the structural funding is gender, number of years in Sweden, the guardian's level of education, the uh, parents or the guardian's financial aid or income, the number of guardians, if the, if the child is living with one or two parents or guardians, uh, the area where the student is living, and then the area where the school is situated. So those seven variables uh, combine in an uh, index. So all schools in Malmö have an index, or even in the whole Sweden actually. And based on that index, the schools receive different funding. And that's a way for uh, to compensate them for the children's very um, different backgrounds and the parents' different backgrounds. And schools use this uh, additional funding differently, but the, mo the majority of the money goes to hiring more staff to those schools in, in the more disadvantaged areas. Uh, we are now implementing a strategic framework in the uh, administration for compulsory education uh, that is called Each Student's Best School. And it's a research-based strategy where, and the framework uh, points out what we shall do and how we shall do it. And it's being implemented in all the public schools in Malmö as at the moment. 
And the focus of this year is the implementation from the school leader level to the school staff level. So, so from the school management down to teachers. Next year, the focus will be implementation from teacher level to student level. And in each student's best school, the kind of the core of our framework is that each student should succeed. Each student should learn from his or her ability and from his or her own conditions. And each student should develop knowledge, values, skills and competencies competences to be an active citizen and to live an independent life in a democratic society. And also that each student should have a belief in their future and an ability to make his or her own choices for his or her future. Mm. We, we lost the contact with, uh, oh, no. with the drive, so I can't really share your screen. Uh, but as soon as we, we move on, we will sort it out. Okay. So if it's okay for you to yes. continue, and then we will, of course, share the pre presentation. I only have one short slide left, and yeah. then we can sort it. Okay. Yeah. Um, we have one of the focuses right now in our in the schools is translanguaging, and that's um, kind of a process where multi-language speakers are allowed to use all their languages. It's also body language um, and their mother tongue. So it's a, it's a way to kind of highlight the fact that to be a multi-language linguistic is an asset. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have done a pilot study or a pilot project where we have a selected numbers of school in the project. And we have had researchers following this project from, from the beginning. And we can see now after two years that the results shows that both the, the teachers, uh, they have developed a more kind of positive view and a bigger understanding for the students' different languages. And it has increased the collaboration with the homes. If a student can do a homework in his, his or her mother tongue, uh, it's easier for parents or guardian to uh, connect with the school. It had also led to kind of an increased self-esteem for these students who feel like their languages matters. It's not only Swedish and uh, an increased engagement in the classrooms. So we are uh, continuing to focus on, on this approach in our schools for the following years. Sorry, Anna, we just got a question from our audience about yes. trans language. Yes. Whether you have developed the definition that you can share. Uh, I can, yes, uh, and it's also based on research. So there are, uh, there is quite a few um, articles and books written about it. So we have also based what is already researched about when we have developed the project. But for sure, I can, I can. We have also did, written a, a report, a research report on what we're doing in Malmo, but that's unfortunately in Swedish. So. Maybe <laughs> Google Translate can help. <laughs> but there are some resources that we can share through the Wildly Include webpage. Yes, later of on. course. Yes. Anyone, anything you want to say right now, just to... to no, I, I, I think the slides will also be shared yeah. afterwards, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. So please continue. No, that was, no. It. that was it. Well, in that case, we're going to move over to Marika, who's also working uh, with an interesting project. And this time I will be able, hopefully, to share the screen with all of you. All right, so can you see this picture of a girl and a boy? Great, yeah. thank you. Because um, I wanted to start with an example of norm critique and how it can work in practice. So I think we should, we can look at this picture for a moment. There are two children playing on a sunny day um, they're exploring their world, they're enjoying themselves, safe, sound, and wholesome. Pretty, right? But if we were to borrow the looking glass to study the scene more closely, some other things become apparent. Um, both children are white, with no apparent disabilities. Both appear to conform to gender norms regarding appearance, clothes, hair. The boy is the focus of the picture. 
uh, intensely studying the leaf as in, that the girl is holding up for him. Her somewhat off focus, almost peering over his shoulder. Hers is the role of the helper, the facilitator. His is the role of the scientist, the explorer. I'm exaggerating a bit, of course, but, but I think you can see what I'm talking about. So is this a problem? Well, I bet you can do a quick Google search and come up with a number of pictures similar to this with children of all sorts of color of skin, roles reversed, uh, girls playing together, boys, one of the children with a hearing aid perhaps, a boy in a dress. Of course, you can find all of these pictures if you search for them. But in the volume of pictures that you find, the majority is going to have the normative traits of this one. So individual diversity is sort of swallowed whole by sheer mass of normative content. Like, for example, in this picture, if you look at the trees. So the number of pictures showing this, that, or the other is not necessarily the problem either. But if we are constantly fed with a similar idea of how things can be, that idea easily becomes a subconscious idea of how things should be. It's only natural for the male to be the center of attention and interest in science is a male trait and girls are so good at attending to the needs of others. And just like that, we have a society built on the idea that men and women are inherently different, that the difference is important enough that we almost don't know how to behave around someone whose gender we can't easily identify or who informs us that their gender is not what we perceive it to be. And consequences follow. Now, naturally, just one picture is not to blame for gender inequality in the world, nor racism or crypophobia or any other type of inequality, but the norm system that's both pictured in it and reinforced and fed by it is to blame. So this example is just to give you an idea of the concept of norm critique and I will briefly outline how the term came to be coined and used in Sweden and especially as it's relevant to the school system. So norm critique stems from the field of critical pedagogy. It traces its roots back to feminist, intersectional and queer theory. In a study released in 2009, the, the Swedish Department for Education stated unequivocally that norm critique is essential for the school's work with anti-discrimination and inclusive practices. So traditionally, what has ruled the efforts of inclusion in Swedish schools has been the idea of tolerance. And tolerance is uh, based on that. Those that for whatever reason don't conform to the dominant norm system or are somehow perceived to be significantly different, the other, as it were, are to be tolerated by the normative in-group. The in-group is given the power to tolerate and implied the power not to tolerate, along with a number of other privileges that come with being the type of person for whom a rule, a content, or a position is inherently tailored. Now, tolerance is usually perceived as a positive word, and it may well be. Um, but I looked in the Oxford online thesaurus. I usually do this in Swedish for the course we had, and I thought I should check it out if it's the same in English somehow. Sometimes words are not really synonyms. Um, but the Oxford online thesaurus paints the same troublesome picture that I found in Swedish. The suggested synonyms for tolerance are sufferance, Charity, lenience, indulgence, permissiveness. Now, who indulges who? Who gives who permission? Who is given the position to be lenient and charitable, and who is in need of this charity? It becomes pretty obvious that to be tolerated is an undesired, troubled position. Sarah Ahmed, who was recently appointed new honorary doctor at Malmö University, she speaks of a host-guest situation that I think very much applies, where some people are positioned as hosts who charitably invite guests into their domain, whereas the guests are well aware of their precarious status, not belonging, ever expected to be grateful for the invitation that can be rescinded at any time. 
Now, individuals in the normative position tend to cling to the idea of tolerance as it comfortably positions us as good people, while we don't need to change any circumstances that allow us to enjoy our privileges. So for people in the in-group, tolerance is really, really uh, seductive. So in Swedish schools, this has long taken the form of a pedagogy of tolerance, what Kevin Kumashiro in his Toward a Theory of Anti-Oppressive Pedagogy calls education about the other. While tolerance focuses on the other and the otherness of the other differences are underscored, norm critique focuses on what bodies or what behavior is positioned as normal, um, unmarked in any given context and what consequences that might have, generating privilege for some and exclusion for others, perhaps. Norms are invisible to us as long as we fit in the norm. It allows us to stand in the eye of the norm, as it were. But the further away from the eye you are, the harder the wind will blow. Tolerance also paints the idea of a unified we, no otherness in the room, whereas norm critique invites you to remember that everyone is in the room. It's just your ideas and preconceptions about them that prevent you from seeing it. This is why some people have to come out with their sexual identity at work, uh, while others don't. Finally, tolerance likes to put people squarely into categories and tends to use that category as an explanation for all sorts of things, making you a representative of your group first, and an individual second, or if at all. So imagine if we, for example, have two girls who refuse to take gym class. A um, common enough situation, at least in Swedish schools, I think. And then imagine one wears a hijab and the other doesn't. Now, a tolerant school might make excuses for the first girl based on ideas about her religion. So she might sort of get um, oh, well, she wouldn't, she doesn't have to, I'm sure it's because of this, that, and the other. While the other girl, we might be looking for reasons on the individual level. So we may talk to her, find out what's going on, are you being bullied, are you insecure about your body, what's going on here? The interest is on the individual rather than the, the group that you're perceived to belong to. Now, the tolerant school this way might miss that maybe it's actually the girl in the hijab that's uncomfortable in her body or that's being bullied. And that's the reason she's not attending gym class. And if we were to fix that problem, she would happily join. So norm critique tries to remember intersectionality, that your identity is more than one thing and different aspects of your identity will be significant in different contexts. Just gonna have a sip of water. Mm -hmm. Can dab my nose. It's that time of year. It is that time of year. Whew. I think I'm maybe halfway through anyway. All right. So norm critical pedagogy turns the mirror on yourself and invites a curious look at what ideas and certainties affect you in your daily life, possibly without you even being aware of it. Although Others almost certainly are, because our biases tend to leak into things we say and do. According to the report that I mentioned earlier from the Department for Education in 2009, they uh, took a look at what norm systems were in effect in school and, and what norms uh, sort of describe the normative student or the in-group student. And they found that to be an, an in-group normative student, you, you have to be easily identifiable as male or female, heterosexual, uh, ethnically identified as Swedish, which, typ which typically means you're white and your first language is Swedish, uh, secular Christian, meaning celebrating uh, Christian holidays, not necessarily going to church, uh, and not have any significant disabilities, especially not any intellectual disabilities that really put you down the pole. So if a student doesn't fit these norms, it's likely they will be subjected to some dis discrimination 
and exclusion from other students, but also from the school system and sometimes even from teachers. Um, and another problematic norm system that we wrestle with, and that's talked about quite a lot right now, um, is the destructive masculinity um, that favors uh, capacity for violence, um, displaying degrading view of anything considered female, and an anti-study attitude, meaning that it's, it's still cool to get good grades, just as long as you didn't work hard for them. So it's likely these sets of norms that have created a gap between male and female students where the male students are being left further and further behind academically because the norm systems um, sort of hinder them from performing the way in schools that they should in order to keep pace with the girls. And also teachers view male students differently from female students based on the same norm system. So problem goes deep. Norm critical pedagogy allows schools and teachers and students to examine and challenge these norms, make trouble with them, uh, to possibly create new, more inclusive and productive ones. So, the strategy in Sweden. Again, the 2009 report from the Department for Education stated norm critique is essential for working with inclusion and anti-discrimination in schools and preschools. But, so that was 2009, but it took some, while, some time for the ideas and practices to sort of take hold. So in 2015, the department's heads, uh, the directors for education in Malmo, decided to join in a strategic effort to introduce norm critical pedagogy in Malmo's preschools and schools, including all the way up to education for adults. This strategy held three steps. One was a mandatory two-day course for all principals and preschool leaders to thoroughly cover Sweden's anti-discrimination laws. And there was some norm critique in there, but, but we were to find that not enough. There should have been a more norm critique um, for the leaders and principals um, as well. After that course, those um, leaders, bosses, um, were tasked with training all of their employees, not just the teaching staff, and that's important, all of the employees in the schools and preschools, um, in norm critical pedagogy. And of course, they were not really up for that task because they got not enough norm critical pedagogy in their training. So it was decided that every school and preschool can sign up two employees um, to receive training as process facilitators. And that's the course that I and my colleague Elizabeth Flores are currently teaching and have been for the past few years. The course is called Inclusion But For Real because there's too much happy talk in schools. Uh, it's uh, six half days of training and three to four weeks in between to allow for reading, observations, and reflection because it's a flipped classroom uh, situation where whatever we do when we're together, there needs to be a point that we're together. So you can't have a room full of people and then say, oh, now read this article because then there's no point for us to be in the room. So they read the article beforehand or they see the video beforehand or whatever. And then they come to the course and we work with the material um, in different ways. Uh, we look at theories behind norm critique, like I said, feminist theories, post-colonial theories, queer theory. Um, we examine different norm systems in schools and outside of schools and the privilege that they generate. And we study how change works as the process um, and how resistance is part of that process. We would tell our, our participants that if you don't encounter resistance, then no change is going to happen because there's no change without resistance. So the participants experience different exercises and reflective tools that they can use together with their colleagues, much of which is uh, structures from cooperative learning. And a very important part of the course are structured collegiate conversations. Um, that's where they sit in small groups, four to five uh, participants, and they're given a structure where their um, time to talk and turn to talk is sort of 
decided beforehand so that everyone gets an equal share of the space for action. And that's where they process the texts or videos and the observations and reflections they have from their various um, schools. So everything we do in the course is meant for the participants to also be able to do with their colleagues. Um, the exercises, the materials, the, the structures for conversation, which means this is a very sort of hands-on how-to course, and that's very appreciated. That's one of the feedbacks we get that they like, that they get very many concrete tools that they can immediately go out and use together with the colleagues. The department heads felt it was important to create cohesion by making sure that each course had participants from all three departments. And that's one of the factors that we've found contributes much to the success of the course. Initially, the participants might focus on the difference, like I work in preschool, I don't have anything in common with the people who work in adult education. But once they realize how similar their task will be, because um, the task for the process facilitators is not to work with students primarily, it's to work with their colleagues, and then everyone at school work with the students in a non-critical pedagogic way, sort of. Um, so once they realize that, they greatly value the different experiences and perspectives present in the group. So it's expected that some 500 school leaders 12,000 employees and 57,000 57, children, students, and adults will be reached by this strategy. That number always sort of catches me. Like, that's a lot of people that are going to be reached by this. Um, and it's a very effective way to work, to reach that many people. Uh, and it's very resource effective. Uh, and I'll give some examples of that, I think, to conclude. So the first course we held was in spring of 2017, and today we have some 250 active process facilitators out there in schools and preschools, working with colleagues, exploring norms and non-critical pedagogy. The course is very popular, usually fills within weeks or sometimes even days after we open applications. Uh, and it's the principal or preschool leader who apply for places, so it's not the individual um, employees. Um, now, implementing norm-critical pedagogy is, of course, a slow process because it's a process of exploration. But we're already seeing some results. For example, we look at how schools tackle bullying and discrimination, both among students and employees and how they're now starting to use norm-critical uh, methods to work with that. Um, and there have also been targeted efforts. Um, there was a, a, a survey that showed that, um, ooh, can't find the English word right now. Uh, well, it showed that there was problematic jargon that generated discrimination and exclusion uh, in schools, actually uh, partially among the staff. So we, um, they wanted to do sort of an aimed effort targeted at this. So we put together a material for the process facilitators. We brought the process facilitators in for half a day of getting acquainted with this material. And then they went back to the schools and sort of work the materials um, with their colleagues. And that was very effective. The cases of reported problematic jargon dropped uh, the next year. Not saying that it's a miracle solution, but if I look at how um, the group that I work for, Norms and Values, usually there was seven of us and we would run out to schools and hold uh, workshops and do lectures and stuff. And there's seven of us there's 250 preschools. There are 75, uh, what's that? 80 even. 80 uh, even, yeah. Mm -hmm. And some, some 15 and 20 for, for uh, upper secondary education and adult education. So you can see that some <laughs> people are spread super thin uh, in a city the size of Malmo. But when you have 250 process facilitators that have an idea of how to work material, with a norm-critical approach, then you can supply them the material 
give them a short workshop or, or maybe even just instructions on how to work it and they can do the work. It's much more resource effective and time effective even. Um, another thing we do is we provide networking meetings uh, about four times a year where we delve into different themes depending on uh, what we think is, is important for the time or what the process facilitators has asked for or what's current. Uh, we have done work on honor-related violence and oppression, racism, street art and youth culture. Uh, next year the UNCRC becomes law in Sweden, so we're definitely going to work with that. Uh, and I think norm critique is going to be really, really important in that work, and I can explain more later if you're interested. So, um, the process facilitators are an effective way of dispersing information and education on all sorts of topic in the field of equality or legality with a norm critical approach. So norm critique is a tool, after all. It has no self-worth other than how it's used. And the most common response we get from participants at the end of the course is, why wasn't this in my teacher training? So we surely think it should be from the beginning. Um, I don't know, what do you say, Patricia? Is that something that the university is talking about? We're talking about it. We're not there yet, uh, but it's becoming a more and more issue for many of the education. Not only the teacher education, but maybe most importantly there. Um, I've got another question from yeah, one of the yeah. audience uh, asking whether the students themselves are trained in non-critical critical behavior for them to understand how to treat and how to deal with peers? Well, the students are invited to examine and sort of um, uh, make trouble with norms. It's, it's not enough just to say that, oh, look, these are the norms for boys and these are the norms for girls and these are the norms for sexuality and whatnot. Not, it's not enough to just state that. If that's all you do, then you risk reinforcing the norms you have to critically look at the norms and, and look at uh, what does it generate? Does it generate privilege for someone? Does it generate uh, space for action more for some people than for others? Because there's this idea that, that norm critique says that all norms are bad and should be sort of um, abandoned. Abandoned, yeah. That would be a very interesting society that I would not like to be a part of. Because <laughs> most norms, obviously, are, are good. We need norms to know how to interact with each other. And schools should also work with strengthening the norms that they find, um, that they want, that, that generate inclusion and all these things. But we have to have tools to discover um, that what might look inclusive on the surface, meaning it seems inclusive to the in-group, how does that affect other uh, groups? Yeah. I think that's an important clarification that we don't see norms as bad. No, no, say, not inherently. Yes, the awareness of norms that we want to strengthen. Exactly, and you have to sort of be prepared to challenge them. Mm -hmm. And that challenge may end up in, no, no, this is actually, a, this norm is fine, we should mm -hmm. keep it good. Mm -hmm. I think this is a very impressive project and I think it's a very brave statement from the city. But when I've been talking about it with colleagues outside of Sweden, they are a little bit puzzled, a little bit worried, saying that this is typical Sweden. And I would like to ask you, is this typical Sweden or is it even typical Malmö? Um, I, to, to be critic to the norms, you mean? Yeah, <laughs> or, or to, to have that strong emphasis on norm criticality within the educational system. Well, <laughs> should I? I <laughs> yeah, go. <laughs> no, I don't see why, because norms is not something typical for a Swedish society. I mean, I'm sure that many of you recognize uh, many of the things that I talk about, the norms that are, are prevalent in, in your schools and in your societies, and you can surely come up with a number of norms that are prevalent in your society that's not in ours, but can still be problematic. So I don't see why uh, it would be typical Sweden or, or only work here. I think it has the same value um, wherever, but the norms that you need to work with might be different depending on um, where you are. But that's the thing again with this, this tolerant um, perspective and how it's um, 
how it's so seductive because privileged people, people in the in-group, uh, they tend or we tend not to see why this is necessary because we don't see the problem. The problem doesn't affect mm. us, if I speak from a imagined... And isn't that just uh, a definition of privilege? Well, in yes, way. in many ways. <laughs> in many ways. Um, and also, um, there's this problem of how, how tolerance paints the picture of us as good people and how important to us uh, the image of yourself as a good person is. And if we're saying something that might be typical for Sweden is that the image of Sweden as a country of uh, equality and how it's not racist at all, that picture or that image, it's so strong that it's really hard to challenge. People get super emotional when you challenge that picture. Um, so that's one of the reasons I think that norm critique faces some resistance because it, it doesn't just place it with the out group and say, oh, poor them, they have a problem. Yes, let's listen to their problem and see if we're going to do something about it. No, norm critique makes you focus on you and yourself and how you're positioned and how the in-group's positioned and how power structures are built and reinforced. Sorry, I tend to go on. I don't, I don't even know if I answered the question. <laughs> in a way you did. I, I will give Anna a chance to answer the same question. Would this happen anywhere else than in Malmö? How much does the context of the city of Malmö uh, make a difference for a project like this? I think it's hard to, to know because yeah. this but is the context aware, we're working. We're not aware, we're not aware of any, any no. other city in Sweden doing the same thing? We're not aware of it being... Well, the concept the wasn't born here. No, no. No. You were saying that clearly, but yeah. 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 But, but on a strategic level and a very... Uh, to include all the schools and preschools. No, I haven't heard of it. I haven't heard of it. But then on the other hand, it's... We should also say that it's uh, then what happens on the individual school level might be very different because some schools use their process leaders a lot yeah. and give them space for action, whereas some might feel like, oh, we have this educated, that's enough. If if needed, we might call for them. Mm -hmm. uh, so we we train the trainers, yeah, yeah, but we don't really know what happens after. But that's an important first step to train yes. the trainers it is. and to, to spread it all over the city. I want to thank you. I just got one more question, see if I can get it up here. Uh, okay, someone says thank you for a great seminar. Right. Uh, thank you. <laughs> and, and there's also a comment, our city is, um, is identifying ourselves as a compassionate city to welcome everyone, but we have not a partner as a school district to spread the idea. Mm. So sometimes you could have the sort of the, the confession at a more yeah. uh, overarching level, but then you have to deal with the everyday situation as well. I couldn't I agree more. The, I think the, if I can again quote Sarah Ahmed, she talks about happy talk and how we like to have these pretty documents where we write all of these pretty things mm -hmm. And then we don't really change anything, really. Because yeah. anytime anyone asks us, we're just going to point to these documents and say, oh, well, well we have process facilitators. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So much like Anna says, there's a big difference to schools that take these process facilitators and see what they can do and really put them to work and give them the space for action to work. And schools who sort of just check the box and say, all right, we were supposed to have process facilitators. Now we have that. Yeah. And they have a possibility. Check the box. Mm -hmm. We are actually running a little out of time, so I wanted to share another few examples of, of how the city uh, have been dealing with this challenge that it is, but also strength, as you said, Anna, mm -hmm. uh, of diversity. So you're going to talk a little bit about uh, another project, and I'm going to mention a few ones that the university are involved in as well. So yes. I want to, again, try to share my screen, and hopefully this time you will get your pictures. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> So uh, first, we're mentioning a, a project that you can also read on the Multi-Include website. So we're just going to say some short <laughs> words about it. It's, um, it's a project uh, with an organization called Your Voice Shall Echo, Din Röst Ska Eka in Swedish. And they work, they, they focus a lot on the empowerment of students to enable them to reach and finding their full potential. Also assisting um, them and also school, school staff to kind of crack the social code. Mm. And they do this through 
uh, training, but also through uh, videos, music, and they have a pod mm -hmm. where they talk about these issues. Uh, and it's uh, it's also a lot of really value based education. I would say it's hard to translate that word from Swedish to English, but. Hopefully you mean you understand what we mean. Yeah, but definitely it is. I know one of the things they talk about is they talk about a lot about the relationship between the teacher and the student. And Yasim often talks about um, how as a teacher you have to have a relationship capital that you build with the student and that you then sort of spend in situations where um, the student's behavior needs to um, be supported. Uh, or even, I, I hesitate to say, but, but modified. Uh, yeah. uh, in so in terms way. of challenging behaviors, you can kind of use your yeah, I spend relational money yeah. in a way. Yeah. Yeah. I think that imagery is really, really effective because, yeah. it, it, again, it places the, the responsibility with me as a teacher. I have to build this relationship with my yeah. students. I can just expect them to be this mass who do what I tell them to. So in this collaboration with the NGO, the focus is both on the teachers and the staff in the schools, but also maybe to a greater extent to, towards the, the children, the pupils. Yeah, I think so they work in two sort of uh, combined. Yeah, yeah, combined. Yeah. Combined. yeah. yeah. but it's also some, a lot to kind of train the trainers. Yeah. So they, they do, Even in this one. Yeah, but sometimes they also do workshops with classes, with mm -hmm. yeah. the kids mm -hmm. uh, in the classroom. Okay. Definitely. Yeah. But there's more information on this on the website yes. and also yeah. links. And there's a film where you can see these two guys. Yes, uh, yes. And, yeah. yes. Uh, uh, and we do collaborate. We do. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. <laughs> um, so um, we're first mentioning a project called Nuva, which is, uh, if you skip, um, it means kind of young people or youngsters in Malmö and their journey to employment through higher education. So it's, it's both a way to understand the routes that they, the, the, the kids take through the educational system. You can skip to, um, and it's um, what we call a knowledge alliance between the city of Malmö and, the, and Malmö University. And we're, uh, we're using London uh, and the work that's being done there as kind of a, a model. So we try to copy as much as possible. We have um, a guest professor at Malmö University who works with these issues in London, he's here, Professor John Storen. Uh, so MOVA tries to kind of build capacity and improve educational aspirations and to provide support at kind of key transition points in kids' educational journey. Um, and opportunities to attain skills, knowledge and empowerment to succeed in their future study. Um, so first we need to understand why are the kids making certain choices at what time. And when we understand that, then we can do some actions. So um, we are now, um, what we've started to do, we can skip if we're short on time here. Uh, what we started with was to kind of do a mapping of, of the activities that is being done, uh, both at the university and in the city and collectively, uh, to kind of the outreach projects, yes. to recruit students from a non-academic background or um, a foreign background or a more disadvantaged background, to higher education. And what we saw was that a lot of the activities that we are doing, we're doing it <coughs> grown up when they're after the age of 19. So this has led to a discussion where we're now trying to focus more on the earlier activities than rather the, 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 the later. We have produced within the, the knowledge lines, we have produced two research uh, reports already. Um, one that is kind of ready <laughs> as we speak, yeah, uh, and one and two years that ago. Be <coughs> uh, Translated into maybe, maybe a summary. Hopefully, if you're interested, let us know, and then we will have a discussion <laughs> around that. <laughs> sure. um, so the first one, one uh, was focusing on uh, the challenges and opportunities for young people's establishment <coughs> uh, so through the higher education. 
and the current one focusing on kind of routes or detours uh, to establishment on the labor market for with the focus on Malmö citizens. And now in the pipeline, uh, we have been working for like a year and a half to get data on an individual level mm -hmm. because we have certain restrictions on that in Sweden. Um, so to do a kind of a retrospective study where we follow individuals that were born between 93 and 99 and then track them through the educational system. What schools did they choose? Uh, can we see a pattern that certain uh, students from certain areas, do they choose an upper secondary school in an, an area or a, a program or to try to understand these choices and to see if we can see some um, patterns. Mm -hmm. And our aim is for that study to kind of serve as a, a well-informed base for political decisions and for school managers to to see where oh where do my students go mm -hmm. 10 years later um, so if we have that information we can make better decisions for for planning yes. but i think it's important to mention that it's not about getting every kid into higher education no it is rather um, understanding the structures yeah. and the reasons for the choices they make um, Yes, mm, exactly. And if we understand that, we can see: do the choose, do the students really choose themselves using their potential, or do they choose what they are expected to? Exactly. So that's our long-term goal in that study. So, so complementing the the um, sort of change of attitudes and understanding mm -hmm. at a more individual level, mm -hmm. we also need to work with the structures to better understand them. Uh, in order to maybe change that, if there's a need for that. Yeah. Of course, the norm critical pedagogy ties into that with the expectations that a teacher might have on this student or that student. Is this student a higher education student? And is this a student? No, no, because of pre preconceived ideas and norms. And, and that might affect how the teacher meets. Mm. Uh, these students differently and that might shape the decisions, probably shapes the decisions that the student might make. Yeah. I think it's important that you mentioned that many of the activities have been focusing on uh, teens or, or even maybe in the yeah. early 20s, whereas we know from research that up until the age of 14 you're more open to see yourself as all kinds of persons, mm -hmm. but then you are quite uh, um, definite in your mm. understanding of yourself, whether you're one person going to university or whether you're not. I see we have a reflection in the chat that's pretty close to what I um, was talking about, how norm critique and, and tolerance um, differs regards to um, students' abilities to cho choose for themselves. Yeah. Talking about this um, uh, early meeting with the potential students, we just briefly want to mention at the end a few other activities that we uh, share together, the city and the university. And I'm going to start with the one uh, called the Nightingale Mentoring Scheme. Uh, in that we, we make a combination, uh, it is about a speed dating, one student and one child in the age of 8 to 12. They meet once a week, two to three hours, uh, during the period from October to May, and they do the things they want to do. So it, it's not about supporting the homework, it's not about training academic skills or anything. They can go to the to the sauna, they can do, go to do uh, things in the park, they can rent a video or whatever. Uh, this started in 1997, so this is a very sustainable collaboration and it has now spread to more than 24 universities, both in Sweden and Europe and actually in Africa as well. <laughs> Now something happened again. <laughs> no? no? I stopped sharing. The other one I want to mention is the, the project that we call <coughs> that we call um, Inspiration 5, whereas the, the mentoring scheme is about individuals. It's one student and it's one child. Mm -hmm. The Inspiration 5 meets a class, a group of students, and we follow them from the year, school year five up until the year nine, because we believe that we need to meet them very early on, but we also need to be in a relationship over time uh, to make them and, and to, to, to change the attitudes. So these two 
projects, they, they complement one another, and both of them, I think, contribute <coughs> to sorry, widening participation in higher education, but also to the integration in the city of Malmö. Mm -hmm. So the knowledge is not always about the child's experiences. It's equally important that the students get to get acquainted to a situation that they wouldn't meet anywhere else. And uh, we can, yeah, can I also yeah, add yeah, there because um, the the study that we are starting <laughs> now within the MUVA project uh, is it kind of started from this because we were asking ourselves the question: So do we know if that if this works? Mm -hmm. Can we see if the students who have participated in Inspiration Five or in uh, the Nightingale project do they apply to higher education or do they? Um, find kind of an establishment on the labor market in a higher extent than their peers. Um, and then inst instead of just looking at these schools that has participated in the Inspiration 5 project, we thought, ah, let us look at all schools in Malmö, because we also need something to, to compare it to. Mm -hmm. yes. And then of course it would be hard to say, oh, we can see that the, they attend to maybe a little bit higher extent, but we will never know if it's the Inspiration 5 project or if it's something else that we of course want to think that it's the inspiration fact, but, but it's very we will never to, know to for really sure. Tell the difference. But that was kind of the starting point of that big study. But what we do know is that we now have mentors that themselves had a mentor as a child. So there's a full circle and we can think that that is... And that also example. say that it's because of that project that I'm now a student. I, I haven't thought about this before. Yeah. So we are actually running out of time. I'm sorry for that. Uh, it was so interesting listening to you both, so I maybe didn't keep track on time as I should. Uh, but hopefully we have shared some best practices, some good examples. All the, the presented cases are on the Multi-Include webpage. And we hope to see you there again. We hope you to join us in January after the holidays and the, a little bit of free time. The Include webpage will be updated with a possibility to join the learning community, to share experiences, but also to learn to join a MOOC around inclusive education at all levels. Uh, so you you want to say something? I want to say something. Yes. I just saw that there were more questions and, and reflections in the chat room, and I think our contact information is, is made available. Yes. Please feel free to, to contact us with, with any questions that you might have, or, or I don't know, if you want to come see how we do things or, or whatever. Just just get in touch. It would be really interesting to hear from you. Yes. Welcome to Malma. You are welcome. You're welcome <laughs> to Malma. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.